Hello everyone, I am Tobes Hussain. I'm here at Two Bedford Row with William Clegg QC, um, or Bill as he likes to be called. Uh, Bill has been described as one of the doyens of the criminal bar, and he's enjoyed a career that spanned decades and has been involved in many high-profile cases, some of which include murder of journalist Jill Dando, war crimes in the Balkans, and also uh, the phone hack in trial. And in 2018, he published his memoir, which is called Under the Wig, A Lawyer's Stories of Murder, Guilt, and Innocence. Uh, Bill, it's great to have you here. Uh, good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, can I start with going back to the past? Can you tell us why you wanted to become a barrister? Um, I'm often asked that question, and um, I haven't really got a, a very convincing answer in, in a way. I think put it down largely to watching Perry Mason on television and um, thinking... Um, what a good way it would be to spend one time and uh, earn your living um, debating and arguing cases in court. Of course, Perry Mason was an American lawyer on television. He was. He also yeah. never lost a case. It was really good, I imagine. <laughs> the, the person who really um, inspired me, I guess, was uh, Atticus Finch, To Kill Mockingbird. I don't know yeah. if you've seen I have. Gregory Peck's depiction. I thought that was really wonderful. It was, a, it was a great film. Yes, it was indeed. Uh, now, imagine that you're 18 years old in 2020. Uh, if you were to begin a legal career, what would you do differently than you did back when you started? Um, well, I think in many ways the um, start is very much the same now as it was then. Um, go to university. Um, I did a law degree. Um, if you don't do a law degree, you have to do a conversion course, takes another year. Um, I was anxious to get started, so I did a law degree. Um, and then you do a year's um, postgraduate um, study, which used to be at what was called the Council of Legal Education. Now there are a number of different providers. Um, once you finish the postgraduate course, um, the difficulty then um, is, is to get pupillage. In, in my day, it was much easier. You only had to pay 100 guineas to uh, somebody who needed the money, and uh, pupillage was yours. But um, today, it's a rigorous series of interviews. So I presume what I would do differently would be to prepare for pupillage yeah. um, more um, thoroughly than I did um, 48 years ago. Although I have to say, I'm a little bit jealous that it was slightly easier. I wish I could have uh, the opportunity to knock on the door and just start pupillage the, the next day. <laughs> yes, I mean, yeah. I think um, the number of um, students who were able to read for um, the bar back in my day was limited by the constraints of the one building, mm. um, namely the College of Law, that um, taught the bar finals. So there was only a limited number of people coming through and therefore it was much easier for the profession to absorb those numbers. Um, the problem today is um, there are many more providers um, providing uh, the course for a, a large number of students who cannot possibly be absorbed by the profession so it's brought a great deal more competition for the pupillage places that are available. Uh, of course, you, you studied law at Bristol, wasn't it? It was, yes. So, um, in, in many ways, you, you defy the, uh, the depiction of the Oxbridge educated barrister, don't you? There? Um, yes, but in fact, at Bristol, there were a lot of um, students who went on to become very successful barristers in my year. I, at least a dozen have went, gone on to become silks. Okay. Um, some judges as well. Well, Bill, let's talk a little bit more about your book, um, Under the Wig. Uh, could you tell us why you decided to write this uh, memoir? Um, I didn't want to write a standard autobiography. I wanted the book to um, really um, help demystify the profession for the general public. And um, I presume it, to some extent, had its... Um, inception when I read a book by a neurosurgeon called Henry Marsh called Cause No Harm, 
in which he explained what it was like to be a neurosurgeon, to people who knew nothing about medicine at all. Um, I found it a fascinating book and thought that if I could do the same thing for being a barrister for members of the public, um, that would um, be a worthwhile ob objective. And, that, and I hope, at any rate, it, it partially achieved that objective. The decision to interpose chapters about becoming a barrister and running our practice with real cases was something that was really um, suggested to me by the publishers um, in order to break up the narrative and also provide a little bit of interest um, to the reader um, about some of the more interesting cases that I've done. I think one thing I really enjoyed about the book is just the way you, uh, you know, define key legal concepts, one of which, of course, is the cab rank rule, which I'm going to ask you about in a minute. But, but of course, you start the book with this profound question, which you get asked many times, which is, <laughs> how can I defend someone who I know is guilty. I just want to give you a chance to uh, explain the answer to that question. Um, well, well, the answer to the question is, um, it's um, inherent in being a barrister that you must accept um, any brief that you're offered that's marked uh, the appropriate fee in the area in which you act. And uh, that's called the cab rank principle because you have to take the next fare that comes along just like a taxi um, on, on a taxi rank. And the, the advantage of that is that it means that everybody um, will have the um, opportunity to be represented in court. Um, however unpopular their case or heinous the alleged crime they've committed. And I think if you reflect about it for a moment or two, um, you couldn't have um, any um, fair system of justice without people being properly represented. So the cab rank rule guarantees that representation will be there um, for everybody and um, hence the system works. And of course if you had to pick and choose I suppose barristers could decide only cases to do cases which were very easy to win which would be a problem for justice, wouldn't it? It'd be a huge problem for justice. Um, and also you would find, I think, that there would be people who would say, well, I, I won't do certain types of cases. So I, you know, I might not defend people charged with rape or something like that um, as a matter of principle, whereas um, we're very conscious of the fact that everybody must be represented, whatever the allegation. Now, I have many friends who would say, for instance, that I, I will only do defence, I will never do prosecution, or vice versa. Uh, is, is it the case that you've done mostly defence work? Yes. Um, um, I'm difficult to put it in percentage terms. Probably um, over 90% of my work has been defence cases. Okay. I have done prosecutions, both whilst in Silk and um, before I took Silk, but... Um, People in chambers used to say it was like the Olympic Games. It happened once every four years. <laughs> Bill, is there a different style required for either prosecution or defence? Um, yes, I think so. I think a prosecutor needs to have a, a rather more measured um, approach to um, their advocacy than um, a defence advocate who can be, um, for obvious reasons, more partisan. Um, the defence advocate obviously is um, arguing the corner for um, the accused, whereas the prosecutor is certainly um, meant to be a, a sort of minister of justice, as it were, in, ensuring that um, the evidence is placed fairly before the before the court. So I think there is a difference in style that's required. And would you say you've probably enjoyed defence work more because of that? Uh, flexibility to really flourish as an Definitely. advocate. Okay, uh, which leads me to my question, my next question about uh, being a barrister. Uh, Bill, in your mind, um, how does one become a successful barrister? Hard work and mastering the cases that you have um, is important. I think that if you are good, then um, you will be recognized as such. Um, in, in the profession and will progress. It's obviously easier if you're in a, um, one would say, an established set rather than um, a small set that perhaps hasn't got a, much of a reputation. But um, 
whatever set you're in, if, if you're good, then you're going to um, be spotted. Um, what makes a good barrister, um, I think judgment um, is very important. Um, the decision about how to approach a case, um, working out at the beginning what you want to be saying at the end and trying to fashion the evidence in your question so that you'll be able to say what you want to say at the end of the case because the evidence will be there to support it. And, and I think um, a degree of spontaneity um, when it comes to advocacy is a great advantage. Um, that's something that's probably only acquired after some years. You, you reference the end of the case, in, in other words, the uh, concluding speech. Um, and in your book, you said that it's important to have humility and humour. To, to have a, deliver a successful closing speech. Uh, I wondered if you could uh, elaborate on what that would actually look like. Humility. There's nothing more likely to put a, a jury off than to have um, an arrogance um, or an, arro an arrogant approach. And, and therefore, I think you need to um, recognise that the jury will be um, considering the evidence very carefully. They'll be very anxious to get the right result. And I think you have to present them with a comprehensible and believable case. And if your case is comprehensible and believable, then you're halfway towards winning the case. The next thing, of course, is to present it to them in a way that they're going to remember it. And um, if you can inject a little bit of humour now and then into what you say to make it easy listening, then that's going to be more um, more chances of um, being remembered than if it's a, a dull monotone reading from a, a script. But but I suppose the uh, the other end of the spectrum is the very dramatic delivery, and sometimes it's probably comical. Have you done this yourself, or have you ever experienced uh, an advocate who you thought, "Wow, that's very very dramatic"? What you would describe as the very dramatic. Um, Advocacy is probably confined to the film set and the television series, <laughs> Perry, than, Perry Mason, <laughs> rather than the real, um, the real life situation. Um, of, of course, there, there there can be drama, and uh, but there's enough tension uh, and in court really for um, the drama to unfold without too much histrionics. And the, and the entire thing in the criminal trial is directed towards really the the jury as, as the yes. audience, isn't it? Uh, what is your view on? Uh, Juries? Are you a fan? Are you... Oh, I'm an enormous fan yeah. of juries. I, I think they're undoubtedly the best arbiters of um, guilt. And um, judges, I think, will be very poor at it. Um, they're not trained for it. I think there's a great danger you become cynical over the years. Um, much better to have um, ordinary members of the public deciding um, simple issues such as um, whether somebody was honest or dishonest whether somebody consented to something or did not consent to something, they're going to be much better um, as a collective unit of 12 to come to a good decision than any, any alternative, in my view. But now, of course, in the age of social media, one of the issues we have, of course, is uh, trying to have juries not research the case further and all that. H have you encountered any difficulties yourself personally? Or and if so, um, how do you think we can approach the situation? And I, I've not personally had a problem with juries um, doing research. They're all warned very strictly not to do any research um, over the internet about a case. And I think 99.9% um, .9 of jurors regard their role very seriously. And if told not to do something, they won't do it. You're bound to get the occasional um, juror who is tempted to look something up on the internet. Um, I dare say in most cases it does no harm at all. Okay. Let's now talk about um, one of your very famous cases, which of course was the uh, murder of Rachel uh, Nichol. Uh, for those of us, well I know, but for, for those who might not know about the case, uh, briefly what was that about and why was it controversial? Well, Ra Rachel Nichol was an extremely beautiful model living in Wimbledon in South West. London. 
and uh, she was taking a walk on Wimbledon Common with her young son, who I think was about two at the time, and in broad daylight, a complete stranger attacked her, stabbed her many dozens of times, killing her and leaving the child next to um, his mother's corpse. Um, it was a murder that horrified the nation. It was taken up by the press and dominated the headlines for weeks. Um, it was also a murder that the police found almost impossible to solve because there were no clues left by the killer at the scene. No forensic um, evidence could be found. Nobody had seen anything that um, could possibly identify the murderer. And despite one of the most extensive police investigations the Metropolitan Police had ever undertaken, after a year, they were really no further forward than they were on the day of the um, killing itself. It was at about that time that in desperation they turned to the um, services of a profiler, really. Yeah. They, they were a, a, a profiler called Paul Britton, who's um, assisted the police by seeking to identify the type of person that, in his view, um, would have committed the crime. And, and by that process, um, a suspect who I defended called Colin Stagg was identified as a potential um, culprit. And he was then targeted by the police in a sting operation to try to get him to confess to the crime by um, introducing him to an undercover, very attractive policewoman. Um, it in fact never succeeded in obtaining a confession, but he was still nonetheless arrested. And um, the profiler um, thought that the way he answered questions, even though he was denying the crime, in a way that I found difficult to understand, um, actually meant that he had committed it. Yeah, so, so in a sense, it was almost a self-filling prophecy in, in the sense that he laid out the, the Paul Britton, mm. yes, he laid out a criteria, I think, sexually repressed, in fan of the occult, etc. And he just happened to uh, fit this profile. So yes. it was problematic because the police weren't going to look outside of that criteria, wasn't it? Um, a self-fulfilling prophecy, really. Um, but um, the, the um, profile that, that he um, deduced, if that's the right word, um, to fit the um, killer um, would, of course, have fitted quite a number of people. Um, they were quite general um, um, descriptions of, you know, single person, sexually repressed, probably living alone, living quite near the um, common, all, all of which most people could probably have guessed anyway. Um, the difficulty was moving from that to identify an individual. And it was that last step that was um, um, a step too far, as, as evidence finally proved, because not only was um, Colin Stagg found not guilty when the evidence of the police undercover operation was excluded by the trial judge, um, some years later, um, Michael Condell's DNA um, clearly identified someone else as being the murderer who um, ended up pleading guilty to it. So there can be no doubt at all yeah. that Colin Stagg was completely innocent. But in your mind, you saw a link, an immediate link um, between the, uh, the actual killer. But this wasn't evident to the police at the time, right? Yes, but that wasn't quite a, a, at the same time. What right, happened I... was after Colin Stagg had been found not guilty yes. and had been released some um, time later, I was instructed to defend um, in another murder case a, a man called Napper. Oh, okay. And um, when I read those papers, um, I said immediately to myself and indeed um, to my clerk um, that that's obviously the man that killed Rachel Lakell. There were similarities between the two murders that were extremely unusual and um, to me clearly pointed to the same person being involved. I mean, each was a 
mother killed by um, a stranger in the presence of a child by a knife with many more wounds being inflicted than is necessary to cause death in something of a clear frenzy. Both took place on or next to common land in South London. Um, th th these are rare murders. Um, it's uh, the most likely person to kill you is you know, going to be your partner or your parent or your child. Very scary. <laughs> it's um, quite unusual to right. have a stranger murder, particularly yeah. in these circumstances. Okay. Well, Bill, well, thank you very much for clarifying that. Uh, it's always a very interesting. Uh, and the other interesting case that um, I, I found fascinating, really, in the book was that of uh, Tadic and uh, Yelisic. How did you find working in The Hague? Um, um, I, en I enjoyed it. I always mm -hmm. found international criminal law a fascinating subject and indeed studied it at, at university. And um, Tadic was the first um, defendant to be tried for war crimes since Nuremberg. Yes. So it was a very important appeal um, where the court was going to lay down really principles that would be followed in, in, in the future cases. So I, I found it um, a fascinating case legally, yes. although a fairly depressing one when you looked at the facts of the case. He was a politician, wasn't he, from Bosnia? And he was a policeman. Police, policeman, yes, okay. traffic policeman. Oh yeah, sorry, that's right. 20 years uh, yes. sentence, yes. Okay. Um, but it was a revelation, really, just how in um, certain circumstances, people who would never um, resort to violence that can um, engage in, in genocide when the political situation and the um, propaganda um, manages to uh, encourage them. And with Yelisic, I remember in your book you describe him as probably the most evil person you'd ever met. Was it difficult for you to uh, reconcile your obligations, professional obligations, and obviously defending this um, character? Um, no, really, I didn't find it very difficult at all. He was, he was an evil man. But um, he, he, the um, appeal w was primarily um, focused on whether he was guilty of um, crimes against humanity or genocide. Um, it wasn't um, as if the appeal was going to result in him being um, released altogether. So he was never going to go um, going back to the former Yugoslavia and uh, carry on his, uh, his torture and killing. It was very much a, um, very much a legal debate as, as to whether or not um, genocide could be proved. Okay. So going from The Hague back to, well, the UK, what do you consider to be the uh, the greatest challenges that faces the uh, the bar right now? Um, well, I think um, the the greatest challenge is the um, government's um, setback um, financially to the Ministry of Justice, the reductions in fees for um, legal aid, and the availability. Um, for legal aid for people both accused of crime and, and in the family courts um, is such that um, it's having a real impact, in, in my view, on um, the ability of the courts to um, administer justice. And that coupled with the further government cutbacks on the amount of time that courts can sit, so all over the country. Courts are empty. There are no judges in them. Nothing's happening at all because uh, the government's not prepared to provide the money to keep the court open, which is meaning that justice is being delayed for people, some of whom may be waiting in prison for their trial of many months, curiously at greater expense than would be incurred had they opened the court and tried them earlier. But um, that comes out of a different purse. It doesn't seem to um, affect the approach of the Ministry of Justice. But it's not their fault, it's, it's the Treasury. There is no government department that has suffered greater percentile um, 
reductions in their fees than the Ministry of Justice. Thank you, Bill. Um, now we're going to uh, do a little bit of an exercise, as yeah. you are a great advocate. <clears throat> uh, have you ever watched The Godfather? I have. Yes, and you know Don Vito Corleone. Yes, I do. Yes, so I, I, I want you to imagine that uh, you're about to talk to him just before you go into trial. Uh, what would you say to him? I'm going to pretend to be Don Vito Corleone. You have 30 seconds to give me a word, and then you have about a minute or less to, uh, you know, advocate for me. So here I am. Hello, how are you doing? Let me um, make you an offer that I don't think uh, you'll be able to refuse. Okay, I'm listening. Don't give evidence. Why? Because if you do, you will be exposed for what you are, and the verdict will be guilty. Okay, I'm ready to go. Do your thing. Members of the jury, this elderly Italian grandfather stands before you accused of hideous crimes of murder. Just look at him. There is no evidence that could possibly persuade you to return a verdict of guilty against this man. <laughs> that was brilliant. <laughs> For a second, I actually thought I was at the Crown Court. <laughs> okay, well, um, now, sadly, you're about to retire. Or yes. What's the situation? Do you have any plans for retirement? Um, yes, we are. we're going to um, travel. I'm going to see more of my grandchildren. I'm going to learn to play bridge. I'm going to have nothing to do with the law. Okay, <laughs> sensible decision in, in my mind. Well, um, any advice for young lawyers who want to be QCs? Or yes, I think so. In the future? If, if, if you really want to do this job, and it's the one job that you really want to do more than anything else, then don't be put off. Do it, because it is a great way to earn a living. Excellent. And any final thoughts, words you wish to share? Um, I think I've said it. Okay. You've heard it from Bill Clegg QC himself. Well, uh, as mentioned before, he's uh, authored Under the Wig, 2018 exceptional book. There's an audio book version as well. I thoroughly enjoyed it myself. And um, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you today, Bill. Thank you. I wish you the best of luck in your retirement. And also looking forward to talking again in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.